Well, good morning. It is good to be back with you all. However, I am gratefully appreciative of those who filled in the last couple weeks, of Glenn and Pastor Doug being able to be here and share with you what the Lord had placed on their heart. What a gift it is to have those two men who are able to come and, and share how God has been working in their lives. And so I appreciate their willingness to be here, but it is good to be back with you all this morning. I was thinking this week about how we use our time and about the things that we spend our time doing. And who here likes to watch movies? A lot of people like to watch movies. That's why it's such a big industry, right? I was thinking about movies and the importance of sequels to movies. And maybe you're like me and you enjoy a good sequel. Now, there are good sequels and there are bad sequels. Bad sequels can totally ruin a movie series for you, and you wonder why did they ever make another movie. But there are good sequels as well. In fact, I was looking on IMBD and a poll they did of the top five best sequels ever. And here's what they were. So from the people who had voted, number one was The Dark Knight. Number two was The Godfather, part two. Number three was Star Wars, episode five, The Empire Strikes Back. Number four was Terminator 2, Judgment Day. And number five was Aliens. Now, personally, I think Toy Story 2 should have been on that list. (laughs) What a great sequel. If you didn't watch it, check it out. It was a great sequel. And maybe you agree with that list, maybe you don't. I like Star Wars, so I think Star Wars should have been a little bit higher as film five was just a phenomenal film. But whether you agree with that list or whether you would have your own top five of the best sequels, sequels are great. They often answer questions that we maybe were left with from the first films. They provide us with the anticipation of what's coming up next, and they allow us to be able to know the characters in a deeper way as we see the story develop over more time. And today, we are starting a new series looking at one of the best sequels that there's ever been, the sequel of the Acts of the Apostles. Now, maybe you're familiar with Acts. Maybe you've even read the book of Acts. It's in the New Testament. It follows the gospel accounts that we have. So in the New Testament, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts comes next. Now, maybe you weren't aware of the fact that Acts was written by Luke, who also wrote the gospel of Luke that we have. And originally, it was two volumes, scholars guess, that were probably circulated together as kind of an independent history of what happened with Jesus and the church. So you had the gospel of Luke teamed up with Acts, And that would be circulated amongst the churches, amongst the followers of Christ, to be able to read and learn about Jesus, his ministry, and how the church began. But early in the second century, as the four Gospels were taken, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and as those were kind of teamed up and put together, Luke detached Acts from those Gospel accounts. And Acts began to circulate on its own until we have the canon of Scripture that was put together where we have all of it together now. And we are so fortunate for that. But you see, Acts is really a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. It's written with that in mind. And as we read it, as we explore it, I want us to keep that in mind too. And the beauty of Acts is it serves as a bridge for us a bridge that moves us from the life of Christ to the life of the early church. And if we didn't have it, there would be lots of questions as to how we get to Paul's letters. We would have wondered who Paul is and what was his story. How did the church start? How did the church grow? And what kind of persecution did they face? Well, the sequel that we have that we're going to be spending time in will give us a picture of how the early church grew how the early church ministered, and how God's power and the might of the Holy Spirit was at work in their lives. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to spend these weeks in Acts looking at the ways in which Jesus led the apostles and the church and the power that they ministered in. Before we jump in, let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you so much for the book of Acts, for the, for the fact that Luke wrote it so many years ago, and that we can sit here today and read it and learn from it. Lord, we pray that you would give us open ears and soft hearts to hear what you have to say. Lord, I truly believe that your word has something for each one of us today, wherever we come from, whatever we've been dealing with, whatever struggles we are amongst, or whatever joys we've had this week. Lord, I believe that your word is here to speak to us today. 
So Lord, may we be changed by you. And Lord, may our lives reflect you more each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we are going to just jump right in. So if you would turn with me to Acts chapter 1, we are going to be in Acts chapter 1 today, reading the entire chapter. It's 26 verses, so we're going to plow right ahead as we intro into Acts and as we get a picture of the beginning of this important book. So Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1, is what Luke says. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So we're going to pause there because there's some that we need to unpack in these first five verses. So Luke is starting this. He's referencing back to the gospel he wrote, which he also directed to Theophilus, who we don't really know a lot about who that is. We assume he's a follower of Christ, someone who's seeking to learn more about who Jesus is. And so Luke has written these two accounts to Theophilus to be able to provide him with information about who Jesus was and his ministry. He's giving witness to both who Jesus was as well as what Jesus taught. And he references this first book, the Gospel of Luke, in which he covered these aspects. In the Gospel of Luke, we see him walk through Jesus' life and ministry. You get a clear picture of who Jesus is, of the ways in which he loved and discipled people, and ultimately of how Jesus went to the cross and died to set us free from our sins. And yet, here, Luke brings it back around to Jesus after he was crucified on the cross, being resurrected from the dead, and appearing to the disciples, that he spent time with the disciples, giving them these commands and speaking with them about the kingdom of God. And this was a 40-day period from Jesus' resurrection to his ascension, of which he spent this intentional time with the disciples, teaching them on many accounts. He spent time encouraging them and teaching them about the kingdom of God. And you may wonder, well, what is the kingdom of God? We toss that phrase around, but what does it really mean when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God or when we talk about the kingdom of God coming about here on earth? And I love how Dallas Willard puts it. Dallas Willard says, It is God reigning. It's present wherever what God wants done is done. It's the range of God's effective will. The news that makes lovely feet is your God reigns. So the kingdom of God coming upon earth is God's reign coming to fruition on earth. It's things being set in the right order of how God intended it to be. And so Jesus spends this time instructing the disciples about the kingdom of God, speaking to them about what it looks like, about the part that they're going to play, I imagine. And then Jesus tells them to wait, to wait for what is to come. He tells them to not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. I don't know about you, but waiting is hard, especially if you have something you want to go do. We've all been in those scenarios where we have to wait for something or for someone, and we want to get going with what's happening, and I imagine the disciples were the same. They'd already been scared when Jesus was crucified, when their leader was killed upon the cross, and they worried that people were going to come after them, and so they huddled in rooms together waiting. Then Jesus shows up. He comes through the locked door. He is risen. His glory is upon them. And he tells them all about the kingdom of God and what they're going to do. And I imagine they're just chomping at the bit, ready to go, wanting to get into the field of ministry that Jesus is leading them toward. And yet now they have to wait. But this waiting is so important. This waiting, Jesus knows, is for their own good. You see, sometimes we have to wait because the timing isn't right. Sometimes we have to wait because we need to learn something first. Sometimes we have to wait because we have to recognize that it's not us that needs to lead. 
but that we have to wait for God to lead us. Sometimes it's learning to trust God and to trust his timing above what we think is best. So Jesus lets them know that they need to go to Jerusalem and they need to just wait. And what are they waiting for? Well, he tells them it's the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that is coming, which he informs them will come not many days from now. And this baptism of the Holy Spirit is available to anyone now, anyone who follows after Christ. It's that indwelling of the Holy Spirit that when we come to Jesus, when we ask him to be our Lord and Savior, to forgive us of our sins, when we profess faith in Jesus that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, by the third person of the Trinity, God the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit essentially moves into our lives and we have access to the Spirit to guide us, to encourage us, and to correct us. See, those are all important aspects. We want to be encouraged by God's Spirit. We want to be uh, taught by God's Spirit. The Spirit helps us understand Scripture when we read Scripture, helps us understand how we are to live out the Scripture in our life. But the Spirit also corrects us when we're wrong. Because each one of us have those times when we make wrong choices or when we have wrong thoughts from God's thoughts. And so the Holy Spirit guides us back to God's way. So Jesus lets the disciples know that they need to go and wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them so that they may then minister not in their own power, but in the power of God and His Spirit. Well, the text continues in verse 6. It says, So when they had come together, they asked Him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So here Luke gives us this piece of the ascension of Jesus Christ. And he's talked about it in his gospel as well, but this is kind of serving as an introduction to the early church and to this book of Acts. And so he's circling back around to Jesus' days on earth before he ascends into heaven. And the disciples right away want to know as Jesus tells them that they need to go wait for the Holy Spirit. Well, is this the time? Is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, they still have their mind set on human ways. They're still expecting that part of why Jesus the Messiah came was not just to redeem them spiritually, but to redeem the nation of Israel. And that's what people have been waiting for, right? They had been hoping that Jesus the Messiah would come with might and with power as a conqueror of the physical. That Jesus would set Israel free from the oppression they were under from Rome. And that's why it was so hard when Jesus died on the cross, because they felt that hope of being free from the oppression of Rome go with Jesus as he died. And they had hoped that he would ride in on a mighty horse, that he would go to battle for Israel, and that Israel would be freed from the oppression of Rome, and all would be right as they were restored. Yet, Jesus had something far greater in mind than what was happening in the physical world. He was much more concerned with the spiritual, which, what was happening in their hearts and the ways in which he wanted to bring about God's reign, not just on earth physically, but spiritually in the lives and hearts of those who Jesus ministered to and impacted. You see, the disciples are still hoping. They're still hoping that the Messiah will free them from Rome, that things will be placed right, that the high priest's role will be restored to what it used to be, that they won't have to be under Rome's authority. And Jesus, once again, tells them this isn't their concern. He points them to the Holy Spirit, to his plan to see them come to fruition in their ministry as they depend upon the Holy Spirit. 
Verse 8 and 9 here show us that their concern shouldn't be on Rome or what's happening with Rome, but it should be on receiving the Holy Spirit and on the power that he will give them to go out and witness in his name. Not just to witness locally, but to witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It'd be kind of like me saying that you're going to witness in Springfield and in Lane County and in Oregon and in the United States and in the world, starting small and getting gradually larger and larger. And this idea that the disciples are caught up in what's happening with them in their nation, the same thing happens to us, that we get caught up thinking about the aspects that aren't spiritual, that we take our eyes off Christ and We worry about the timing of when God will show up in the way we want him to show up. See, that's ultimately what the disciples wanted. They wanted Jesus to show up in the way that they wanted, in the way they envisioned God's best coming to fruition, which was in Rome not being in power, in Israel being restored as the state that God had chosen them to be. And we do the same thing. Rather than look to God for his timing, to look to God for how he wants to move, We get our own idea of the best way that God could move, and we think that our way is God's way, rather than looking to God and asking him to lead us in his way and truly humbling ourselves under his authority. So like the disciples are learning, we also must learn to focus on the power that we've already been given in Christ, on the one who guides us that we have dwelling within us, the role of the Holy Spirit at work in each one of us who profess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And we must allow that message that we have in Christ to go out from us, not to be held personally, but to go out into the world and to share the hope of Christ with those around us. Well, Luke shows us this picture of Jesus ascending into heaven as his bodily form, not just a spirit. It's not just like he floats away like a a Casper the ghost, but Jesus' bodily form is is ascended into heaven as the disciples are still standing there gazing up at heaven, at where Jesus just left to, two angels show up. And we know that they're angels because of how they're described here in the text, that they're two men in white robes, which has been used elsewhere to show this idea of angels in their midst. And the angels kind of question, why are you still standing there looking up at heaven? Jesus, who is taken from you, he will come again, and he'll come in the same form that you just saw him leave. So we know that Christ will come again in a bodily form to bring everyone who believes in him back to himself. When I picture the angels showing up to the disciples, it doesn't say this in the text, but I envision they're kind of like, why are you still standing here looking at Jesus? He's gone. You're going to have the Holy Spirit. Let's get to work ministering. Let's get to work at fulfilling the commands that Jesus left you with. Don't just stand here staring into the sky. But Jesus has told you that something greater is coming. So we see it picks up in verse 12 that they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath's day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, and Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. So there's the disciples that are left. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So the disciples return to Jerusalem. They're being obedient to Jesus and his instructions to go and wait for the Holy Spirit. And as they wait, notice how they wait though. They don't wait with no activity. They don't wait just passing the time, not doing anything and just dwelling upon what's happening right in their midst. But they wait not without action, but with the most important action, with prayer. They are in prayer with one another. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. They have a like-mindedness that's present amongst them as they pursue Christ. Their lives that are devoted to Jesus show that they are also devoted in prayer. You see, if you follow Christ, if your life is devoted to Christ, you also should be devoted to prayer. And so the disciples show this as they wait, that they devote themselves to prayer, seeking the Lord. They're trusting in his provision. They're trusting in the fulfillment of what he said would come. And while they wait, they wait in prayer. A good reminder for us if we're waiting for anything right now, if we're waiting for God to show up in a way that we feel he's led us, 
if we're waiting for God to direct us, perhaps, or to provide for us, that we don't just wait absent-mindedly, but we wait devoted to prayer. Well, the text continues in verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And he said, Brothers, the Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all of his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So we see here Peter's leading the group. Peter is showing his leadership as we know that Christ has empowered Peter. He's told Peter he's going to build the church upon him as the rock. And so Peter jumps up and starts off with this speech, moving this group of 120 people forward, pointing them to Scripture and encouraging the people to recognize how the Scriptures are being fulfilled. And Peter starts by naming the elephant in the room, the disciple who had betrayed them all and ultimately betrayed Jesus, Judas the Iscariot. And he shows that now that Judas is dead, it's time to move forward. And Peter points back to the Psalms to show not only how it was foretold what would happen, but also to show that they should now elect another to take his place, quoting Psalm 109.8. So he recognizes the need now that Judas is gone to elect another one to take his office, to fill out out that number of 12 disciples that Jesus had originally called. Who knows why he felt the need to have 12 uh, besides the fact that it says let another take his office in Psalms. Perhaps it's the idea even of Jesus sending them out in pairs of two, that in order to be sent out in pairs of two, 11 doesn't really work. So if you have 12 disciples, it works a little bit better. But they decide to elect another one. And so we see this play out in the remaining verses, picking up in verse 21. It says, So one of the men who have accompanied us during all this time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Bersabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So they're seeking to replace Judas. They need a disciple who's been there with them the whole time. They want to put someone forward who can bear witness to the life and ministry of Jesus and ultimately who can be a witness to Jesus' resurrection. So they're not just looking for someone who's a new convert to Christianity, who's a new follower of Christ, but they're looking for someone who can bear witness to the entire ministry of Jesus. So there's some stipulations that they place upon this. And they put forth these two men, Joseph, also called Justice, and Matthias. And notice that then they pray. They put forward these two men and then they invite the Lord into this decision, deciding who should be the twelfth disciple, the twelfth apostle. And then they cast lots. Now, when I read this before when I was younger, I'd always think, then they cast lots? Like, they're picking the twelfth disciple and they're like, let's just roll some dice and decide who's the twelfth disciple? Did anyone else struggle with this when you've read this? Like, why would they leave this up to chance? But when you think about it, they've vetted who these two men are. They've made sure that they're both upright, great men who were with them the whole time, who've been faithful to Jesus, who could fulfill this role. They've then prayed about it. And then, yeah, they are leaving some element to chance. Now, the idea of casting lots, people believe that God worked even in the lots that were cast. There's many different ways that lots were cast, but it was kind of the same idea as drawing straws or as rolling dice. And we see it throughout Scripture used multiple times. We see it when Jonah's on the boat and they cast lots to determine whether he should be thrown off. We see it with the guards casting lots to divide up Jesus' garments. So there are these elements of chance with it. And the way I think about it is you have two great men 
who could both fulfill this role of apostle. So how do you pick? How do you decide which one it's going to be? And so they cast lots, trusting that God will guide that, that God will be glorified in whatever decision is made, and they pick one of them. Both of them would have been great choices. It's not like they had a bad choice and a good choice, and they casted lots and just let it roll with it, but both would be great choices. And so they cast lots, which also means that they're not picking one as a favorite as well. They're letting it stand what the Lord led in that way, and they believed that the Lord worked in that. Now, we don't really cast lots anymore. I don't know anyone who makes decisions that way. When you guys brought me here as pastor, I don't believe you cast lots trying to decide if it was the right choice. You did. Okay. Jay's saying you did. Maybe that explains some things. (laughs) Heads or tails. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so we have this 12th disciple who is named. Matthias is chosen as the 12th apostle to replace Judas, someone who has been faithful, someone who has stayed with Christ, who has not betrayed Jesus. And thus the scene is set for the beginning of the church, for the beginning of the ministry of the apostles, and to see how God brings about the fulfillment of his kingdom, to see how he brings his spirit upon them as they wait. And we'll see that in the next chapter. This opening of Acts has walked us through Jesus' final time on earth before his ascension. It's shown us the importance of the Holy Spirit and shown us how the disciples practically moved forward after being betrayed by Judas. So what does it mean for us? What does it mean for you and for me? What are the important truths that we can take from this first chapter that we can evaluate in today's text and apply it to our lives? Well, I want to suggest three things that we can do. The first is to seek the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells the disciples to stay put and await until they receive the Holy Spirit. There is an importance in having the Holy Spirit when we minister. It is true back for the disciples. It's true for us today. And so we must also seek to have the Holy Spirit in our lives and pay attention to the gifts that we have received from God. I think that one of the challenges in the church today is that far too often we downplay the role of the Holy Spirit. We sometimes neglect to listen to Him and thus ignore God. To give you a picture of why this matters, I want to share with you the experience of a park ranger in Yellowstone National Park. This particular park ranger was leading a group of hikers to a fire lookout. The ranger was so intent on telling the hikers about the flowers and the animals that were around them as they went on this hike that he considered the messages on his two-way radio to be a distraction. So he switched it off. As the group neared the tower, the ranger was met by a nearly breathless lookout who asked why he hadn't responded to the messages on his radio. You see, a grizzly bear had been seen stalking the group, and the authorities were trying to warn them of the dangers. Yet he had switched off his radio and was totally oblivious to what was happening and the danger that they faced. You see, every follower of Christ has the ability to tune out the Holy Spirit to ignore the promptings that the Holy Spirit gives us. And I believe that the more that we ignore those promptings of the Holy Spirit, the more we ignore the voice of God in our lives, the quieter it seems to get. I believe that the opposite is true. The more weight we give to those promptings, to the voice of the Spirit leading and guiding us, the clearer it becomes. The more easily it becomes to distinguish the voice of the Holy Spirit. Any time that we tune out the Holy Spirit or ignore the warnings of Scripture, we put ourselves and those around us in danger. If we want to follow Jesus' way well, we must use our lives to seek the Holy Spirit. That must be how we start as we look at this text today. Once we pay attention to the Holy Spirit, we can move forward to our next application, which is to minister empowered by the Holy Spirit. Dr. Paul Brand was speaking to a medical college in Indiana on Matthew 5, 16, which said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In front of the lectern was an oil lamp with its cotton wick burning from the shallow dish of oil. And as he preached, the lamp ran out of oil, and the wick burned dry, and the smoke began to make him cough. He immediately used the opportunity, saying, Some of us here are like this wick. We're trying to shine for the glory of God, but we stink. 
He said that's what happens when we use ourselves as the fuel for our witness rather than the Holy Spirit. Wicks can last indefinitely, burning brightly and without irritating smoke, if the fuel, the Holy Spirit, is in constant supply. You see, if we are to follow Jesus' instructions, we must not seek to minister in our own power. Far too often, when we try to share the gospel or our lives to impact others, we try to do it on our own accord. We neglect the Holy Spirit and His leading, His guidance, His power at work within us. We must be fueled by the Holy Spirit. Our efforts to minister must stem from the Holy Spirit, from prayer, trust, and dependence upon Him. I love how Charles Spurgeon put it, stating, Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without the wind, branches without sap, and like coals without fire. We are useless. Well, once we are trusting in the Holy Spirit and ready to minister out of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can then follow Jesus' instructions to spread the gospel. I love how Luke puts the interaction between Jesus and his disciples, that they are to be a witness to Jesus, not just locally in Jerusalem, but as we said earlier, even to the ends of the earth. And if we want to follow Jesus and practice living lives committed to him, then we must seek to be witnesses to him with our lives. We must use our lives to share and to point people to Jesus Christ, recognizing all that he has done within each of our lives, proclaiming it to those around us and spreading the gospel wherever we have opportunity. To encourage all of us in the efforts of this this morning, I want to share with you a video that I found impactful in thinking about how we spread the gospel. It's called The Power of Multiplication. So go ahead and take a look. Would you rather be given $1 million or one penny doubled every day for 30 days? You remember this question from math class, right? This is when we all learned the power of compound interest and exponential growth. At the end of 30 days, that doubled penny becomes just over $5 million. Turns out, the same concept applies to missions. Imagine you filled a football stadium with 100,000 people for a gospel outreach event, and 20% of them came to know Christ. faithful to the simple multiplication principles of the Great Commission. The entire world could be discipled in our generation if we started with just one. What about you? How might God want you to be involved in making disciples that make disciples and seeing movements of Jesus among every tribe, tongue, people, and nation? Would you rather fill a stadium every day for the next thousand years or commit to making one disciple this year? 
Let's do this together until all have heard, starting with discipling one. So, who's your one? I love the concept that that video gets at, because sometimes it feels daunting, right? Sometimes we think about sharing the gospel, and we think about how many people don't know Christ, even in Lane County, and it feels overwhelming. Like, how are we going to get this message of hope, this important message we have that so many people need to hear? How are we going to get out to everybody? Can we do enough events? Can we fill enough stadiums with people to know Jesus? And yet, that breaks it down to the simplicity of just one and begs the question of who is that one person that this next year that you could seek to disciple to Christ, to invest time in, to pray for, to share your life with, And the impact that could have could be profound if each one of us sought to disciple one person next year to Jesus. Well, Jesus, before leaving and ascending into heaven, he told his disciples to do two things, to wait for the Holy Spirit and to be his witnesses to the end of the earth. If you are here and you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the good news is you don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is already accessible to you. Perhaps you don't give him too much attention or you may not depend upon him how you should, but he is there. You don't need to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. You just need to listen and trust the Holy Spirit and seek to be Jesus' witness today. So may each one of us here in this room and watching online faithfully fulfill the call upon our lives. May we stop living for ourselves, for our own comforts, for our own desires, for our own appetites, and may we live being focused upon bearing witness to who Jesus is. May it not end with just our friends who have heard about Jesus or know him already, but may we go out to those who are lost, who don't have the hope of Jesus. And may we share being boldly empowered by the Holy Spirit for God's glory. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit that you have given each one of us. Thank you that we can depend upon you and that you will lead and guide and direct us. Lord, our lives are yours. We hold our very lives open-handed, trusting you to lead and guide us. And so, Lord, may you open up the doors so that we may seek to disciple just one this year. Lord, as we sit here in this room right now, Lord, as we bow our heads before you, I pray that you would impress upon our spirits Who needs to hear Jesus in our lives? Who is that person who is lost and we don't even see them? Who's that person who needs hope and just needs to be asked? Lord, may we be faithful as you guide and direct us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the time here today together to encourage one another in our pursuit of you. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.